inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. I'm your host, Katie Morton. If you don't know me, welcome. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I've been creating educational mental health content online now for about 10 years. So welcome to the community. Each week I go through about 10 of your questions and it kind of depends on how many comments and questions we get on top of the questions, meaning that when I ask for these questions on the community tab of my podcast channel, which is called Opinions That Don't Matter, that's the name of the podcast I have with my husband, Sean. Anyway, when I ask for questions over there, if you pose a question and someone else has something very similar to ask, they're like, oh, I'll add on to that. You know, what about this too? then I add those at the bottom of said question. So one question may turn into like five. So sometimes I don't get through all 10, but today we have 10 total questions. So let me get a drink of water. Let's get into it. Question number one reads, oh, and also guys, before I jump in, I'm so sorry. I want to remind you that my book Traumatize is available now, so you can order yours through the link in the description of this video, or you could just search Katie Morton Traumatized for like on Amazon or wherever books are sold and pick up yours today. I hope it's helpful. I hope you all love it. And thank you all so much for your support. Okay, now let's get into question number one. And it reads, how do you tell or show your therapist that you're doing worse than what she thinks? My therapist thinks I'm doing fine, but I'm not. I feel like I'm dying from the inside. Thanks for all that you do. And there was a comment on this says, on a side note, my therapist tells me that I talk a lot about the issues in my life, but never about how I feel concerning these issues. I find myself fighting the feeling to puffer fish, Ooh, stick our spines out, protect ourselves. And I'm pretty sure it's because I see the validity in her assessment. Problem is that I built such a wall between what has happened and how I feel about it that I honestly couldn't suss out what I feel, let alone provide her an explanation. The mere thought of trying to dive into my feelings causes me such anxiety that I automatically push it away. Of course, we all know how that can, that's how that can feel. I've had some pretty traumatic things that happened to me in the past. And as much as I want to work on these issues in therapy, I can't seem to even start the conversation with my therapist. I find myself downplaying the issues by looking for the positive aspects to focus on instead, even though it often doesn't make me feel any better and it just makes things worse. And she won't take a, I don't know for an answer. That's because she's a good therapist. My knee-jerk reaction is to just change the subject to avoid the very thing that I want to talk about. It's like I'm defeating my own purpose. Any suggestions on you may have on how I can push past these walls so I can just begin exploring whatever my feelings are would be greatly appreciated. Okay. Now there's there's more there are more questions after this, but let's get into these first two. Now the first is saying how do you show your therapist tell or show? My honest opinion is that we should need to tell, not show. And the reason showing doesn't work for me is because trying to show is a very passive action, it, meaning it, we're not actually being active in our communication strategies or in working to better explain what's going on and what we're going through. And showing leaves a lot up to interpretation and it also means that the therapist has to pick up on that and then if they don't we can feel invalidated or minimized and the therapist didn't even know so instead of expecting a therapist to read your mind and your body language all the time which we do try to do the the, the body language reading not the mind reading mind reading would be oh my god my job would be so much more helpful i'd be like oh they're lying right now and i would know right away but because we can't read your mind and we might miss some body language things because we're not perfect, the best way to let your therapist know that you're not doing well and you feel like you're dying inside is to just tell them. And one thing that I've, I've said over and over throughout the years, and I want to say again here, is that don't worry about what it sounds like. You don't have to even have answers to it fully. You can just say, like you told me, she thinks I'm doing well, but I feel like I'm dying on the inside or from the inside. Sorry. Say that just like you said it. Let your therapist know, hey, I know that you think I'm doing well. I'm really not. I sometimes feel like I'm just dying from the inside. Okay. As a therapist, I would say, oh, wow, I had no idea. Thank you so much for telling me. And then I would dig into a bunch of questions about it to try to gather whether this dying from the inside is like depression, anxiety, is it suicidal thoughts? Like, what are we dealing with? I'd want to know what that really means. And I would ask questions in order to dig into that 
and not judgmental questions, more just like, okay, so you said dying from the inside. So can you explain a little bit about what that feels like? Like, is your motivation zapped? You know, if, you do, if you're like, I don't know, I'd say, okay, well, has your motivation changed? How's your sleep? How's your appetite? I'd ask a shitload of questions because that's my job. Then I'm doing my job. But in order for me or any therapist to do our jobs fully, we have to have as much information as you can share. Now, I know it's uncomfortable and it's hard to share things. However, I do want you to know that, you know, we're going to have to do our best to communicate. It's like with with a therapist, if we give them as much information as we can, even though it's uncomfortable, and they meet us where we're at and offer support or insight, tools, techniques, things like that, that's how we get the most out of it. That's like gives us the best outcome in therapy. And so the best way to tell your therapist is just to say it how you said it to me. And you could even say, sometimes I feel like I put on a brave face, but I feel like shit. That would also do. That's also plenty. Um, don't don't get so caught up in having all the answers because that's what a therapist is for is to help you come with, up with, like not come up with those answers but help you figure out what's going on by asking questions and we, we discover it together so you don't have to know it all right away okay and then that second component of the question is like how do we you know push back against those walls the, the best thing if we've been completely cut off from our emotions and we can't connect to how we feel about certain situations the best way is to get those uh, feelings charts. I like the feelings wheel, go to feelingswheel.com, one of my favorites, but you get a feelings chart, pull it up on your phone and, and bookmark it or print it or write them out or whatever you like to do, it's up to you. And then each and every day, start by trying to identify one or two feelings. Now I know you're thinking, well, Katie, it's supposed to be feelings about a specific situation. I want to see how well you're able to identify any feelings about anything. How disconnected are we? So you want to do this first. If this is easy peasy lemon squeezy and you're just cruising through this, you're like, yeah, I can come up with so many different uh, feelings. Then maybe after that, we should be able to, we should instead not be able to, but we should instead take this practice to certain situations, meaning like the trauma we've sustained or the issues that we're having with like a friend or a mother, then ask about the feelings, then try to come up with one at a time. And then the next step after just coming up with the feelings is then trying to describe what that feeling's like. Like what, what are the thoughts that come along with it? Where do we feel in our body? Is there any impulse that comes with it? I'm just curious, be curious. And using words to describe it without using that feelings word, meaning if the feeling that I'm experiencing is excitement, I could describe it like, it's like, I can't catch my breath. Every, my stomach feels like bubbles. I'm just, I can't help but smile. And the, the time just flies by really quickly. Let's just say that's excitement for me, but I'm not going to say excitement feels like excitement <laughs> because that's not helping us describe it in any way. Do you know what I mean? So those, those are just some of the tools and ways for us to kind of push back like past those walls to get in touch with our feelings little by little. Now, somebody else had a question on this. They said, as an addition to this, what if you are telling your therapist how bad things are, but she just continues on calmly with the same stuff? Like, I feel like I'm destroying everything in my life with my constant horrible decisions. And my therapist just tells me to be more kind to myself as if number one, I can do that. And number two, it will fix all the things I'm continuing to blow up. I like that she's so calm most of the time. Some things I feel need to be changed urgently. Why doesn't she feel the same? I've even ended up in the hospital after a suicide attempt last week, and she didn't care or discuss it at all. Wow, it confuses me. I don't know how to express this to her without getting more dramatic and making worse decisions. Okay, there's a couple of things. I really like this part of the question too, because a the therapist's job is to be able to contain things that feel out of control to us, meaning we can feel like we're just like throwing bombs on our life day after day and like creating chaos and drama. But a therapist's job is to breathe with you, let you know it's okay to talk about that and hold the space for it, meaning we're not going to react. Uh, you'll, it's very rare that you will see your therapist react. The only time I think I might have a reaction is when someone's talking about someone who harmed them and how much they want to punch them in the face. I'm like, yeah, me too, right? Like that would be a reaction, but that's about the only time you'll catch me doing that. Otherwise, therapists are supposed to stay calm so that we don't, as the patient, feed off of that therapist's energy and feel worse, right? It's almost like, you know, when you're with a friend and if you're both having a bad day, you can really 
like go in, in the pit of despair together. You can just like spiral down really, really fast. However, if you're with a friend who's having a great day, your pit of despair spiraling is less likely to happen. And that's what a therapist's role is. So that's why therapists do not react and tend to be very calm. However, I do believe there, there seems to be some oversight with what you're telling me on your therapist part, okay? Meaning that I feel like your therapist isn't seeing certain things or maybe not giving you the support that you're needing. And I'm very curious just out of suspicions if there's some borderline personality disorder going in here because um it the the confusion and the wanting you know not wanting to get more dramatic or making worse decisions feeling very impulsive that can be a component of bpd and i'm curious i wonder if if that's going on and sometimes therapists will err on the side of less reaction when it comes to patients with bpd because they don't maybe fully understand or know how to treat them properly i'm just throw, that's just something that bubbled into my brain. So I want to put it out there. I don't know if that's true, but that's just something that sometimes comes to mind because I've had a lot of my BPD patients tell me about past experiences like these when their their therapist just did not usually treat borderline and didn't really know how to communicate about it. So, okay, with all those things being said, the way to tell your therapist, we're going to have to address these issues head on, meaning we need to say to your therapist I feel like I'm destroying everything in my life. And when I come in here, I like that you're calm. However, I feel like the only advice or guidance I get is just to be more kind to myself. And I'm not able to do that right now. I need more, period. Now I know that it can be really hard for us to say that. And those that those are my words, not yours. So feel free to put that into your own words where you explain essentially what you're telling me saying, you know, I had a suicide attempt and I really wanted to talk it through because it was really, by the way, suicide attempts can be super traumatizing. Nobody talks about that, I feel like. So we need a place to talk about it. And you can say it was really traumatizing and I've never felt that dark or bad before and I really need to process it through. Can we do that? Sometimes we have to advocate for ourselves and ask, can I do that? This is what I need. I'm coming to you and I'm telling you what I need. Can you give that to me? Or I feel like I'm making these constant horrible, like constant horrible decisions. I need more support for that rather than you just telling me, you know, to be more kind to myself. Those are all the, those are the things that I would say. And first of all, if you haven't heard me say this before, you can practice saying them ahead of time, write some notes down, say it out loud over and over and over until it feels just like so easy to say, that even if our emotions get the best of us and we even want to dissociate or we feel really anxious, we'll be able to get the words out because we've said them so many times. Right, so practice, 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 so we can get to that point. And then if your therapist does not adjust, now I don't expect any therapist to make like a complete 180 and like change everything they're doing. But if your therapist doesn't, then A, give you time to talk about the suicide temp and process it, and B, come back with like the next week or within the next two weeks with some tools and techniques and resources for you, then you might want to find someone else because a couple of things, this just might not be a good fit or this therapist might not have the skills or understanding to help you specifically with your issues, right? They might be better uh, able to manage people who have, I don't know, struggling with a depressive episode after a tough, you know, kind of a situational depressive situation or going through a divorce, or maybe they're good with anxiety. I don't know, but I'm just saying that in your instance, they may just not, not be the good, the right one, but we have to give them a chance but to tell them what we're asking for and what we need. And if you practice doing that, I think you can do it, you know, do it pretty quickly and without forgetting what you want to say and getting off topic or oversharing a ton of things that don't really pertain to this issue. Because my goal when you go to talk to your therapist about this is to keep it very succinct, meaning, like I've said in the past, like up to five bullet points of information maximum. And honestly, in this case, I feel like there's only like two or three. Like, I feel like I'm always being told just to be more kind to myself and I can't do that. And I feel like I need more support on my impulses and I'm making horrible decisions. And number three, I'd really like to talk more about my suicide attempt because that was really traumatizing. I've never felt that bad before. Can you help me? And then we have to give them a chance to do that, right? Because we go to therapy to get support and help. And if they're not giving us what we need, we need to let them know. And if they continue to not give us what we need, then we need to find someone who will. 
I know that sounds harsh, but otherwise just a waste of your time and money. And I want you to get, you know, have the support that you need, right? It's, it's hard enough to reach out. So when we do, we want to make sure someone's there. Okay. Final component. Now this person said, now as a follow-up, if you don't see a therapist, how do you tell your parents that you're doing worse than they think and you need to get into therapy? Oh, and there's one more after this too. It says, in my case, I feel as if I say how I feel or felt in a certain moment to my therapist, this act would be seen as if I'm trying to get attention or I'm being an attention seeker. Let's answer that part first, then I'll get into the parents thing, just because I feel like we're shifting gears a little bit with that. So if you say something to your therapist about feeling a certain way, a lot of people worry that that's attention seeking behavior. Now, the, the truth about this is I would tell your therapist you have thoughts like this, that you worry that if you tell them how you're feeling about a certain thing or something's very upsetting and you want to express it, that you are worried that that's attention seeking behavior. Just let them know because the therapist to me immediately is like, I'm curious as a kid, like this is where I would go with this as a child, you know, were you did you feel like your parents came when you cried and were there when you needed and emotionally supported you? Hmm. If you don't remember, that's okay. We'd move on. I would say, you know, have you ever been told you're an attention seeker before? And if the answer is yes, by who and what was the situation? Or if not, then I would say, well, what would make this more attention seeking, you know? And, and then I would be curious. I'd say, I, I'm not aware that attention seeking is a bad thing. You know, as humans, we all need attention. What do you, what do you think is bad about it, being an attention seeker? If someone was, you know, we dig into that, but I'm very curious about this, like lack of, it's not like validation, but it's like, we're not worthy of support. And if we try to get support, then we're just seeking attention. And that's a bad thing. We're, we're saying that as if it's like a negative thing. And I don't think attention seeking is a bad thing. We all seek attention in different ways. And if we don't get it in one way, we can change our, you know, our mode of action. Like if I'm trying to get attention as a child, let's say, and I try getting straight A's in school and I try to do all the extra work around the house and I do all this stuff. And my, let's say it's my mom I'm wanting attention from, doesn't pay me any more attention. But then if I get really sick, mom gives me attention. Ha ha, I have a lot of eating disorder patients who have done this. Well, then I know that in order to get the attention that I so desperately seek, I have to be sick. So then I can get colds all the time or I can get an eating disorder, you know, and I know people say like, oh, eating disorders are a choice. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying it's a coping skill. I'm not getting the love and support that I need and I feel emotionally neglected, meaning I'm actually emotionally abused. I'm feeling that way. That's what's happening to me. And I'm doing my best to get my needs met. And that's how I'm going to get my needs met. I'm coping with it, right? Or maybe I self injure, or maybe I get more attention when I'm in trouble. So then I start causing trouble at school or whatever. Um, now I know that a lot of you might say, well, that's bad behavior. Sure. You could say, oh, certain actions weren't, weren't healthy for me or didn't, you know, weren't, what you'd call a quote unquote good decision. However, it's still attention seeking and we all seek attention, whether that's through po what we would deem positive behaviors or more negative or harmful behaviors. But either way, we all seek it out. So I really want us to change the way we talk about attention seeking behavior and move it from something negative into something that is just commonplace. It's something we all do. It just is part of being human. We all need that connection attention is just connection, just another word for it, right? So that's, um, I would just talk to your therapist about it, let them know that you're having this experience and, and let's learn about it together. Now, the final part about how do you tell your parents you're doing worse? In my experience, it kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning about ways to tell your therapist, like keeping these bullet points really short and direct. Do the same with parents. Come up with maybe three things and then always end when it comes to parents always end with how they can help which you already kind of know because you're like you need to get into therapy okay so here's like an example i would say to let's say it's my parents i'd say hey mom and dad i know i've been doing well in school and sports and you think i'm doing great but i've been feeling really really down and i've had a lot of anxiety at school i'd really need your i really like it if you could support me going to therapy and i'd like to start soon is that something we could look into that would be it. Or something to the effect, if you want to share less, you can just say, hey, mom and dad, 
I know I put on a happy face a lot, but I've been having a real tough time and I really would like to see a therapist. I think that could be really helpful for me. And I'd like to get in to see someone soon so that it doesn't affect my grades or ability to, you know, do what I need to do at school or work or whatever. And then maybe the ask for them is, could we look into a therapist this week? Is that something we could afford or we could make happen? You know, that would be kind of the the last bullet point. But keeping it really short, the more we say, the more overwhelmed our parents can get. And we need to give them small digestible amounts of information because this isn't going to be the only talk that we have about it. This is just the start of the conversation. So we don't have to dump it all at once. We just have to let them know we, we're feeling not great. We need some support and that support needs to be in the form of therapy and we want to make that happen that's it and then give them time to digest it it might take our parents like a day or two to come back and be like yeah you know some parents might have a reaction or a response right away we hope it's positive but just giving them some time keeping it short and succinct is the best way to reach out and let them know so that then they can take some steps to better help us okay let's move on to question number two and also if any of you are worried because you're on lockdowns and everything like that Almost every therapist now is offering online therapy and there are resources like BetterHelp, Talkspace, um, even Crisis Text Line. Not That's not therapists, but that's some support if we need a little additional support. Anyway, there are a lot of online resources. So don't think that it only has to be in your specific small town or little area. We can find someone online and that gives you, you know, uh, a kind of a broader net to cast, right? We can look for people who might be usually too far to drive, but we could be able to see them now because it's online. Okay, question number two says, hi, Katie. I don't know why I'm like this, but I want to be sicker than I am. So many questions this week, this um, week about, you know, being sick, not sick enough, feeling like they're, they're not seeing our real selves. It's interesting how we have these themes. Okay. I don't know why I'm like this, but I want to be sicker than I am. Like I know logically, I probably only have anxiety. I like how we've already downplayed, only have anxiety. Anxiety can be debilitating. It can feel terrible. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. Sorry. Back to the, back to the question. Like I know logically, I probably only have anxiety and maybe autism, but I want to get diagnosed with a personality disorder or a borderline or schizophrenia or something more serious. I always overplay my symptoms and emotions. I'm always looking into all these disorders that I might have and secretly want to have. Then I wonder if that in itself is its own disorder, like factitious disorder. It could be. Lots of times when I research different disorders, I think I may have, I start to adopt the symptoms to further convince myself and others that I have it. I'm always changing my personality slightly based on new information that I read. I got diagnosed with autism when I was 16, but I think I faked that too. I remember being in the interview trying to act stereotypically autistic so I have a better chance at getting diagnosed. Do you have any insights? Okay, this is very interesting and I have a lot of thoughts. Now, first of all, it could be something like factitious disorder. If you guys don't know what that is and you want more information, I have an entire video on my main YouTube channel. Just search on YouTube, Katie Morton factitious disorder, and it's F-A-C-T-I-T-I-O-U-S disorder, okay? Look that up and then I'll tell you all about it. It's essentially when we kind of pretend that we have disorders that we don't. There's also other things we can pretend that we have a physical illness, not a mental illness. Um, but I don't, that's not what's going on here. So we won't get into that. However, that, that could be what it is. And I want you, I want to put that out there that it's very possible. And I don't know if you're seeing a therapist, but I would encourage you very, very much to see someone and let them know of your worries about this. The truth about being diagnosed with like personality disorders, autism, bipolar, schizophrenia, um, usually we have to be assessed. And usually these assessments are done by, you know, a psychologist or even therapist. We can be trained to offer assessments like that or a psychiatrist. But either way, they'll sit you down, you fill out some paperwork and answer yes, no, or questions or what is it from one to five. How much does this apply to you? You know, not at all, all the time, stuff like that to better understand what it is you're struggling with. But I have to be honest, assessments help somewhat, but I personally prefer to spend time with patients. Like if we're looking into a personality disorder, I wanna see a patient for at least six months, potentially a year, because I wanna see it played out in different seasons of life and different situations. And that will tell me more about it and whether or not I feel like it's, you know, needs to be diagnosed. However, with something like bipolar disorder or even schizophrenia, 
we can see some of the symptomology pretty quickly. Meaning, let's say someone comes in with bipolar disorder, but we don't know that yet. We think it's just depression. Well, if they're treated for depression by their psychiatrist and given some medication that will push them quickly, unfortunately, into a manic episode or hypomanic episode. And I will see some of that like pressured speech, difficulty sleeping, um, can even have delusions as a part of this or anything like that. And so we'll see it play out. And we'll be able to more quickly and easily diagnose. And the same with schizophrenia. We can see some delusions and hallucinations. And if you don't know what those are, delusions are like firmly held beliefs. Now, they say firmly held beliefs because they're just, they could be these random beliefs that I, uh, oh, that the, the FBI is listening to me through my television. Now, no matter how what you tell me, or even if you get rid of my TV and I get a new one, that I'm still gonna believe that they're listening through it. It's it's nothing can change. I, it's firmly held in my brain as truth and nothing that anybody can say logically or any no one can prove anything to me that's gonna change that, okay? Then a hallucination is when we see, well, it's really, it's mainly if we see something that's not there, it's when something's like added to our world, but we can have, those are called like positive hallucinations when something's added, like I see a person that's not there, I hear something that's not there, or I feel something on my skin that isn't you know, there. But there can also be negative hallucinations or negative um, symptoms of schizophrenia. And that's when it's like things are removed, right? Where, um, and these aren't necessarily hallucinations, these negative symptoms are things like, and I don't wanna get too into the weeds on this, but like we can actually get like frozen in a certain position or we can have a blunted affect, right? Something's been taken from me as a person. I'm missing something that someone without schizophrenia would just have naturally. And so those types of symptoms, we have delusions, hallucinations, or negative or positive symptoms of schizophrenia. We would notice those things more quickly and be diagnosed right away. However, um, when it comes to this question, because I feel like I kind of got off topic there, but I just wanted to explain a little bit about assessments and testing and getting properly diagnosed. We just need to let someone know that we think we're doing this. And I, ha I mean, I have a ton of questions. Part of me wonders about emotional abuse in your life. Like if you were neglected in some way and didn't feel like you got any attention. And like I talked about in the first question, did we get attention when we were sick? Maybe we did. Maybe that's the only time we got attention. And so we go craving it, looking for ways to get it. And this could be one of those ways. Or are we severely depressed? And we've, you know, have tried to, as a way to validate how badly we feel, we think we need a different type of diagnosis because it seems like you know that you have anxiety and possibly autism or autism spectrum disorder, if any of you are wanting to know what it's called, the ASD diagnosis. If you're wanting those, di or you think you have those diagnoses, it perhaps you feel like they, you know, do not explain enough how you're feeling and how, how hard that has made your life or how bad things are for you. And so therefore you go looking for other things to further explain it because you don't feel like those do it justice. And if that's the case, again, Tell your therapist because th this could come from a lot of different places. I find factitious disorder usually come is born out of abuse. Not always, but in a lot of cases it is because we go seeking that attention, seeking that that love, that compassion, that understanding, and we think that we're going to get that through, you know, being sicker than we really are. Maybe. Or maybe we just don't feel validated by it. Maybe we need more support. I would talk to a therapist, let them know that you, you're worried about this. There's no shame in this. Let them know, hey, I'm not even sure what I struggle with, but I know that I find myself often wishing I was diagnosed with something, you know, with a severe mental illness. And I'm not sure where this is coming from. And I even find myself faking symptoms. You know, you can say that to them. It's okay. We're trying to figure out why. We're trying to figure out what this helps you. Like, is this coping with something? What does this help you accomplish? And it could be a lot of different things, but at least you're aware. At least you're aware and you're willing to admit that you notice this is happening. So find a therapist and talk about it with them and we'll figure it out, okay? Keep us posted. Now, question number three says, hi, Katie, I hope you're well. I am, thanks for asking. Says, can we please talk about what happens when depression starts lifting? I am starting to look back now and I feel so sad at all the time I've lost, at all the, um, and all the energy I need just to survive and how different I am now. Okay, gotcha, so you're looking back and lamenting about all the, the depression essentially took from you. 
At the same time, there is this pressure to make up for lost time. Where's that pressure coming from? Internal, external? I'm curious. But I realize I just, or I still can't handle as much as I used to. Of course, you're just newly in recovery from this. And depression is just starting to lift. It's like, we're not, it's not black and white. It's not all or nothing. We're not depressed or not depressed. We're not as depressed. Therefore, we feel a little bit better. We can do a little bit more. Okay, sorry. I'll continue. How do I start feeling happiness again without feeling guilty? I don't even know what this quote unquote new me likes anymore. How do I get to know myself again now that I'm so different, but still vulnerable? Thanks, thank you for all that you do. Okay, and then someone, um, there's follow-up questions on this one comment. However, I wanna dig into this first. So of course you can't handle as much as you used to. You're also different now, but also like I said, the depression's just lifting. It's not all or nothing. It's like it's like a, a spectrum, right? And so, um, how do you start feeling happiness again without feeling guilty? I guess I'm curious about the guilt. Is the guilt because you are looking back and feel guilty for the time that passed when you were depressed? Are we able to offer ourselves a little compassion here? I'm curious about those thoughts and I would want you to pay attention to those guilt thoughts and what they're telling you. Like, okay, so we're feeling kind of guilty. What does that look like? What does that sound like? What are we telling ourselves? And then can we use some bridge statements or even just some simple fact checking to argue against those thoughts, thoughts even slightly? Meaning if one of the thoughts is you've wasted so much time, you know, you have to get this all done now. You're so lazy and stupid. Or I don't know how nasty your thoughts are, but that's just commonly what I hear. Okay. So if those are your thoughts, then are we, are we open to potentially recognizing that thought and saying, you know what, that's not helpful. That's hindering. And instead I'm going to force my brain to think of a more balanced one, meaning my thought would be something like, I am glad I have today and it's possible that that's what I should focus on. I'm struggling and I want to feel guilty, but I am glad I feel better today. Are we able to do that? Is that too much? Maybe we go back further and we instead say something like, you know, it sucks that I lost that time, but I'm open to the possibility of better times tomorrow. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Those are some opportunities for growth and opportunities to come up with more balanced thoughts and not allow these negative ones to just take up space in our brain and tell us that they're true. Because essentially what those thoughts are is you're just, your depression is still hanging, right? It's not completely gone because it's not like turn the switch. That's not how depression comes and goes. Um, it's still there. And those are just this negative self-talk. It's that depressive thoughts. Okay. Now, uh, then the next question, how do we start feeling? Okay. How do we start feeling happiness without feeling guilty? I think part of that is managing those thoughts and paying attention to them and also acknowledging that, that depression doesn't come and go black and white on and off, that we still have a little bit of depression and we should be reframing our happiness as thank God this is finally here. I thought the depression would never lift. I'm glad I have this moment of not feeling so heavy or tired or negative about the world. Can we maybe think those things maybe a little bit? It's, it's the keys and the bridge statements, I tell you. But then here, the new me and getting to know yourself again, the best thing I can, the best advice I guess I can give for this, the best thing I can say is to start exploring things again feel free to try out new things, new music, uh, new outdoor events. Like maybe you did used to love going hiking, but you don't know if you do anymore, let's give it a try. Or maybe we wanna try mountain biking, or maybe we wanna try going walking with our friends or swimming, or maybe we don't like outdoor stuff. Maybe it's indoor stuff, okay? Can we try to pick out a couple new books at the library and see if we wanna, you know, if that's what we want to do with our time, or maybe it's, you know, different music, like I said, or maybe, you know, we let our friends decide plans for a weekend and we just go along and, and pay attention, see what we like and don't like. No judgments. We don't like everything. And some things are tolerable and some things are, you know, absolutely nevers, right? But until we try them out, we often don't know. Now, this does not give you, I'm not trying to give people permission to do something that's harmful to themselves or something that's, you know, really dangerous, but I'm just saying, it's okay to be like, hey, you know, I'm gonna go out to the water this weekend. I'm gonna see if I like kayaking. Never done it. People talk about it. I'm gonna give it a go. 
and we go rent a kayak for a couple hours and maybe we're like, absolutely not. We come in after 20 minutes. That's okay. We learned, we tried something. Maybe next we try a paddleboard. Maybe we're like, I don't like water at all. I don't know. Maybe you wanna try cooking. Just get kind of creative. Think of the different things that you could do. If you're struggling to come up with those things, talk about this in therapy. Let them know that the depression is lifting, but you're struggling with a little bit of motivation and some some guidance, and they can give you some small to-dos each and every day to help you feel like you're moving along and making progress. But it's okay to, and then journaling about it also helps. If you struggle with doing things, let your mind wander about the things that kind of seem enjoyable. Even if you're on Instagram or TikTok, are there certain things people do that you're drawn to? Are you like, oh my God, I really like watching this guy make pottery. Could we maybe try to take a pottery class? Or maybe we want to try cooking something. You know, we can see someone doing something and if we're interested, we should check it out. Okay, a comment on this says, in addition to this, what about when you are less intensely suicidal or trying to look towards living? Wanting to live is insanely overwhelming because all of a sudden you realize you're now supposed to care and do things that you didn't before. And it's still hard to give a shit about se- about said things. When it gets too much, I wish I were still suicidal when things were easier until I remember just how horrible it felt. How can I go about not stressing myself over this? Small, small baby steps. That's the problem. Our brains for some reason are always drawn to these like all or nothing, in and out. Am I depressed or am I not? Flip that switch, am I suicidal or not? I should be doing all of these things. If I'm not this, then I have to be doing all this. I'm here to tell you, it's best to live in the middle. And what I mean by that is, okay, so we're not feeling quite so suicidal. Does that mean we have to do all the things? Absolutely not. We can't, we didn't do them before. Maybe we don't even have the energy, we're not even sure. Seems overwhelming, we shut down. So it doesn't get us anywhere anyway. Could we instead, maybe, plan for one small thing this week. Maybe that means, you know, normally I can't keep my house clean because I was just so suicidal and so depressed. I didn't have any energy. Could we this weekend wipe up the counters in the kitchen and put some things away? Maybe take the trash out. Could we do that? That would be all that would be on your list this week. Let's see how that goes. Could we maybe shower twice this week? Could that be our goal? I think that could. Or could we eat more regularly. Maybe we could even, you know, save up a little money. So next week we can just order this food that's already ready. So we don't have to cook it. So it's a little less energy for us, but we know that we're going to be eating every three to four hours. Could we do that? Because that's like more sustainable energy. Hmm. Setting these small goals of, think of it as like reintegrating slowly. We can't just jump into the deep end. We haven't learned how to swim yet. Allow yourself to tiptoe back into the water of life get to know it again. What's it like? What is it that I want to do? What is it I don't want to do? Allow yourself the time to slowly get back into it. Otherwise, it's almost like we've popped our head out and we look around and we're like, shit, there's a lot of stuff to do here. And this is way overwhelming to my system. I'm going to go back inside and we go back in our shell and we don't want to come back out. And and then we remember how bad that shell felt, meaning the suicidal thoughts or the depressive symptoms. It's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to go back there. But new is uncomfortable too. And so allow yourself to be curious and slowly become comfortable. There's no judgment or guilt needed around our discomfort now. We're adaptable humans. That's what makes us so amazing and we can withstand so much. That's why we're so uh, resilient is because we can adapt. We're, We're okay, right? Things happen and we shift and shape. So we're shifting and shaping in a more positive direction. We need to give ourselves the time and energy to do that. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay. Um, I think, okay, that's it. Let's move on to question number four. This question says, hey, Katie, happy Thursday. I pray all is well with you. Thank you, it is. I want to ask you, as a therapist, do you find it challenging to not wear your therapist hat in regular situations where you're not in that position of being a therapist? Not really, but we'll get into it. For example, hanging out with a friend or family member, sharing deep conversations, or if a friend or family member is having a difficult time in a particular scenario or situation. Or is it something that most therapists generally have to work at all the time, setting and maintaining those boundaries between psychoanalyzing a friend and or a family member, or in a particular situation during your regular life? How do you handle it um, if you do make a mistake and cross that boundary without meaning to do so? My daughter obtained her bachelor's degree in psychology, but she's taking time away from school because her children are young and she wants to go get them through school. 
And she's also dealing with some mental health issues herself, but she's been expressing a desire to go back and finish school and maybe become a therapist. So I was just curious about that kind of scenario with her. Great question. Now, the truth about being a therapist is being in that mindset and like psychoanalyzing and trying to think through uh, patterns of behavior, tools that might be helpful, uh, maybe some questions I should ask and ways that you actually move therapy along being a what I would call a good therapist. It's exhausting. I could never do it all the time. And I, I physically, I feel like I, I mentally and physically shift into therapist Katie when I'm with patients. I've always been that way. I don't know if it's because I'm like predisposed to be a therapist and I just have this rigid boundary with myself. I did not enjoy online therapy with patients or even phone sessions. I've always hated those because it's it's a, I have to like take some time out of my day to like shift into therapist Katie, like often changing my clothes, sitting in my office, and then I have to get in the zone and then I have to do it and I cannot be disturbed. It's like a separate me. Like even a lot of my friends and colleagues still went into their office when they were doing online sessions because being at home was just too disruptive and it's not, they didn't feel good having that in their home space, if that makes sense. And so I definitely have that rigid boundary myself where I would have preferred to go into my office and see patients that would, you know, like do my sessions there. Um, so no, I don't, I do not psychoanalyze friends or family. However, something that does follow me and that I'm unable to turn off is patterns. So what I mean by that is because in, in therapy, regardless of whatever you treat or specialize in as a therapist, you see a lot of toxic relationships, whether it's the person that you're seeing that's causing this mayhem in their life or um, a couple, you know, you see couples or if you just hear about, you know, narcissistic mothers or uh, toxic partners or friendships that don't go well or whatever, I've become very good at sniffing out uh, essentially what I would call like toxic people and people who tend to rub people the wrong way, have some narcissistic tendencies or some, uh, I don't know, kind of like almost abusive or manipul manipulative behaviors. And I can sniff those out pretty quickly. So that's one thing that I'm not really able to turn off, but it's almost like my brain without realizing it is like taking stock of those things. So it doesn't really take up any extra energy necessarily. And it has helped me uh, end friendships when needed and maintain boundaries with other people when needed to protect myself or those that I love. Um, and so, so yeah, I guess that's really it. I feel like if a therapist is having trouble maintaining boundaries between personal and professional life, they need to get into their own therapy. I feel like doing my own work has really allowed me to, and I know this might sound harsh to some people, but it's not my problem, like to be able to do that with work. Like I'm glad they're getting help and I'm here to help, but then when I leave, that's not my problem anymore, right? There's a separation. Like for those of you who don't work in the in the health field, when you leave work, you know, are you able to like leave it at work? Hopefully you are. I think all of us need that like cut and dried line. Unfortunately, working from home, like blurred that line. And I think it's really messed with our mental health and our work-life balance. And so I would encourage all of you out there, if you're struggling to do this, have these like transitional things, like change into clothes, like put on at least like a bra, if you're, you know, if you wear a bra and a dressy uh, topper, work topper, maybe it's even a tie, I don't know. Put on some kind of work clothing. And then when the work day is done, I want you to change back into your home clothes so that there's at least that physical transition so we can feel like we have that boundary. And that can really help. Um, yeah, and then I haven't really made a mistake or crossed the boundary, but I guess if you did cross that boundary and like, I don't, you'd have to let someone know you were doing this. And I just cannot imagine a, a space where I would like psychoanalyze a friend or something and then come to them with it and be like, you know what, I'm thinking about it. And I think your husband's a narcissist. I would just never say that because that's not really helpful. As a friend, I would say that doesn't seem very healthy. And like, how that make you feel? I just ask questions like, did you and like, how'd you deal with that? What'd you say to him? You know, be the regular friend. I'm not trying to dig into their brains and figure out what's really making them tick. Um, yeah, but I guess if I did come across and do that, I would keep myself in check and I'd probably talk about it in therapy and be curious about why that was hard, a hard boundary for me to hold and how either if I did tell them how they felt about it and how I felt about it and why I wouldn't want to do that again and try to process it through, I guess. But that's really it. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. And yeah, it's an interesting question. It's good for me to think about that stuff because some things 
you know, when things are easier to you, obviously other parts of being a therapist might be more difficult for me than other people, but that just happens to be one of the things that's easy. It's good for me to think about it and try to better understand like why, you know? Okay, question number five. It says, hey, Katie, is it common to feel as though you are lying or exaggerating when telling your therapist um, things that happened in the past? or what symptoms you have, or how your week has been. My thoughts tell me not to tell these things because I'm lying, but I know I'm telling the truth. Love this question. And again, see the the theme that runs through it, you guys. It's funny how if you're ever out there and you're thinking, I am all alone with this. I'm so weird. I can't believe I'm even you know, writing about this. Somebody even asked a question this weekend, said, I was actually afraid to put that out there. I'm glad I'm not the only one. You're, you're not the only one. That's the beautiful thing about our community. The, community. That's why I love each and every one of you. I love all the comments you share with each other. It's just, it's so heartwarming. So you're not alone. Okay. Now back to this question. Yes, it's common to feel as though you're lying or exaggerating because especially when it comes to trauma and just to reiterate, if you do not know, um, we can have big T traumas, meaning like these big events, like I was in a car crash or I went to war or was you know physically beaten by my stepdad for 10 years we can have these big t traumas or we can have what we call little t traumas that can lead to the same result meaning we can still develop ptsd symptoms and have dissociation and all these things so like that are connected with p to ptsd and those little t traumas can be things like my parents got divorced i had to move a lot i was bullied for a little bit in school i had a lot of health complications as a child, maybe had a chronic illness or had a lot of surgeries when I was little, but surgeries can be very traumatizing. Nobody talks about that. There's a lot of things that can be traumas, okay? And when we grow up with a history of trauma, which I feel like almost all of us have some kind of traumas, then part, I don't know why this is, but part of PTSD to me, or even just having a traumatic past is in the future, we tend to minimize and invalidate ourselves. And I don't know, my my hypothesis has always been that that is us just like surviving because if we actually acknowledged all of the pain that we went through or all of the hurt we sustained for this chunk of time, then we wouldn't be able to emotionally or psychologically be living, right? It'd be so overwhelming. We wouldn't be able to do what we need to do. And so just logistically speaking and kind of resilience, the resilient part of our brain is like, we cannot dig into that. So this isn't true. This can't be true because if it were, we couldn't survive. So let's just ignore this and move on. And that's kind of part of the like stuff it down, try to forget that it happened, minimize and validate. It's part of this pattern, which we all know, I don't want to get into this too much, but it, it can feed into like the shame, the guilt, the embarrassment that kind of comes along with trauma. And so all I say all of that, really because yes it is common to feel as if you're lying or exaggerating when you talk about things that happened to you in the past because for so long you've been telling yourself it's not that bad it's not that bad i can keep going don't worry about it you know i don't want to talk about it it's not too bad or like oh the you know even if someone does know about the abuse like let's say a really close friend or family members like yeah, I'm so glad that dirtbag's finally in jail. Or I've heard from a lot of uh, viewers over the years, like finally they passed away, right? Oh, I just want them out. I just don't need them here. But even, you know, people can say that to us and we're like, oh, even if that's a validating statement, right? They were such a dirtbag. I'm so glad they're not around anymore or something like that. We can say, yeah, I mean, I'm glad they're not either, but it wasn't that bad. Like we can minimize immediately. And if we don't say it out loud, we can say it in our head. You know, it wasn't that big of a deal. I'm okay. I'm totally fine. You know, don't, don't worry about me kind of thing. And, you know, that's protective. It could also have been something that we said and did within ourselves because no one was coming to our aid. That's unfortunately what a lot of people go through where they're, you know, struggling with trauma or abuse in some way and no one comes to support them. No no parent protects them. And so and we protect ourselves by pretending it's not that bad. That's why no one did it, right? So anyways, long story short, and I don't want to belabor this any longer, but this is really common because we minimize and invalidate in order to survive and in order to to push through. And so that's why we can feel like we're doing that when we're talking about symptoms, we're talking about how our week has been or what's happened because we've never felt safe enough to acknowledge and accept what's really going on inside of us. And that's part of the work in therapy. And I would just let your therapist know that you're experiencing this. And you could even say, you know, I've been thinking about it and I feel like it might be, you know, tied to 
to just trauma and feeling overwhelmed and that I, I feel like I've been doing this forever, you know? And once we kind of figure out, the, once we obviously acknowledging this and working to to push through and tell it anyways is great. But then I think we might even want to dig into like some of the triggers for this, because I'm sure there are some things that we don't have this strong of a reaction to. Like we don't necessarily think, oh, I'm I'm lying about, I don't know, maybe a very benign thing that happened yesterday. We might tell that easily without having this come up, but there might be other experiences, situations, or people, you know, certain triggers that, that cause this feeling. And I'd be curious about that too, just to learn more and to figure out ways, again, ways we can kind of like overcome it, push through it. I hope that helps. Okay, let's move on to question number six. This question says, hey, Katie, I hope you have a wonderful day and are okay. I am, thank you. Oh, it says, seeing your video about your burnout made me worry about you, so I wanted to check in. You guys are so sweet. Yeah, I I am feeling better. I'm taking weekends completely off. You've probably noticed, like even on Instagram stories, I'm just not as active on the weekends. And that's just part of my self-care and what I need to do to take care of myself more long-term, right? And like setting up good patterns. Um, but it was also just kind of cathartic to get that out there. So thank you for, you know, all your support and all of your love. Okay, now, over the last year, I've been going to therapy. I've been going because of my last relationship, which was probably with a narcissist. My therapist, my therapist has known me since I was 21, and I'm now 28. So he's been on the sideline for many years, including when I was in my last relationship. The first time I met up with my therapist, after I broke up with my ex-girlfriend, which was probably six months after the breakup, I said to him that I was slowly losing it because I kept ruminating about her and had read so much about narcissism, and I was thinking that she might have been a narcissist, to which he replied, bingo. And then we proceeded to talk about it. It turns out he had a strong hunch. He's not allowed to diagnose someone he hasn't met. True. In the entirety of my past relationship, which was three long years, that my ex was a narcissist, or at least had strong narcissistic tendencies. Now the question, how come that if a therapist can clearly see that you're in something toxic, like a relationship with a narcissist, that you or they don't tell their clients that it sounds unhealthy and try to help you out of it directly? Is there something greater to be had by learning these things on your own rather than helping someone out before it becomes a possible trauma like it has become with me? Thanks in advance and thanks for your amazing content. Your small place on the internet is a bright light that makes life a little bit easier to deal with. Take care and have a nice day. Love from Denmark. I'm so glad. I love our little space on the internet too. Okay, this is a great question. And the truth is, as a therapist, we can hint at things. Meaning, we, if we thought your ex was a narcissist, when you're in the relationship, we might make mention of, of certain behaviors or certain things and say things like, well, that seemed kind of manipulative. Or we'd highlight things and say, did that, that felt kind of abusive. Did you feel that? Or, or what came up for you? We wouldn't, and I, that's even tough because I wouldn't necessarily lead a patient like that. And leading means like I'm putting words in their mouth. Like I'm saying that seems kind of abusive. Like I would just kind of let you talk about it and ask more questions for clarity. Like, you know, did they do this or that? Or did you feel this way or that way or what came up for you when this happened i might try to ask more of those types of questions so that i don't lead you because i want to make sure this it's your experience and not me putting words into your mouth you know what i mean it's this fine line therapists have to walk to make sure that you're able to process what's actually going on for you not what i assume is going on for you you don't want to make assumptions as a therapist and so because we a are only seeing one side of the story because we're seeing we're you know seeing you and not your uh, the person you're in a relationship with and also because we don't know them, we can't diagnose them. Like you said, you can't diagnose someone you've never seen before and haven't seen. It's honestly, you can't diagnose someone you haven't seen in your practice, period. People don't recognize that, but that's the truth. And we can have hunches, but the benefit to us not uh, helping you out of it directly is that often if we do that, so this is something that to think about. Consider a friend in your life and I, we've all, I feel like everybody's learned this lesson. I had a friend in college who was dating this guy who was cheating on her. And I knew the girl that he was cheating on her with. And I had seen them when I was out with friends. I'd seen them out on a date. And being what I thought the good friend that I was at the time, I came to my other friend and I said, dude, your boyfriend's cheating. I saw him out. I was with so-and-so. And he was out with her like last Friday night. And he's a dickwad and you need to dump him. This guy's a jerk. 
She's like, no, he's not. And he, he told me he went out with her. It was, it, he was supporting, you know, it was like this whole story he had put together. And I was like, they were on a date. And she's like, well, did you see them kiss or anything? And I was like, no, but like, I could tell they were on a date. Like they touched hands, like, look. And she's like, you're exaggerating. She got so mad at me. We didn't talk for quite a little while. And then she caught him cheating later and they broke up and then she came back around like, I don't know, six months after that or so, let's say. And so I lost that friend a little bit and I learned my lesson that me saying someone's a dirt bag and even catching them in the act sometimes is not enough because she had to decide it on her own. And I don't know why this is that people are like this, but we are. We think, especially with romantic relationships, that nobody understands it. You don't get it. You don't know how much I love them. Or you don't know, even if we don't say this out loud, we can think it in our heads. They don't get it, we can think. They don't know how intense this is. By the way, narcissists in relationships do what's called love bombing, which, especially after they've been super abusive, if they want to get you back, or if they think something, you know, you've in some way distanced yourself from them, and they feel that distance, they will love bomb. And that means like throwing everything at you, like, you're the most amazing thing ever. I really want to be, you know, I've never loved like I love with you before. I mean, Lord only knows, they can send you gifts, they can do all sorts of things trying to get your attention back, because they need that for their uh, supply is what they call it, the narcissistic supply. So anyways, as a therapist, we don't call it outright to you because we don't know where if you're there yet. And it's not up to us to push you to break up with someone just because we think that they're not good for you. That's a lot of assumptions. And that's a lot of judgment on our, on our end. And that's something we don't do. Now, I've had a lot of patients who've been in relationships that I do not think are healthy. But I can guide them toward that that discovery or that conclusion, but I can't draw it for them. Does that make sense? Because you have to draw it yourself. And I'm just, I don't know if anybody can relate to this, but when you discover something on your own, which has happened, if you've ever been in therapy, I'm sure at least you've had one aha moment where you're like, oh my God, oh my God, right? When you have that moment, you don't forget it and you really learn your lesson. And I'm saying that personally, like I've been in therapy and had some like, oh shit moments, a lot of them. And I've learned my lesson and I do not do those behaviors anymore. And I don't engage in relationships like that because I remember because I learned it. However, my therapist has told me a lot of stuff and shared a lot of insights and I forget that stuff sometimes. Let's be honest. And so that's kind of part of it. It's best for us to come to the conclusion on our own. I know you'd like to think we could save you from the trauma and we should pull you out, but I'm just here to tell you that even if your therapist had tried to explain this and, and outright told you, I think they're a narcissist, you might not have taken their life raft and gotten out on your own. Because again, you have to decide to do it on your own. As a therapist, we can not we can push like that and then we will, it will push a patient away and we can actually maybe do more harm than good. And so that's, there's a lot of reasons why we don't call it out directly. It's always better, like always, um, for you to re realize it on your own. The only reason we would ever call something out directly or intervene is if you're in an abusive relationship and there's like a protected class involved, meaning like, are you a child? Are you a dependent adult? Are you an elder? If there's abuse happening, then we have to report it. And so that would be kind of like our only direct, like call it what it is thing. Okay. I hope that makes sense. I know it's kind of hard to understand and like, why wouldn't we just help you out and pull you out? Unfortunately, that's just not the way people work. We don't often like to be told what to do or to be called out, especially in relationships like that. Okay, question number seven. So it says, hey, Katie, I keep seeing questions about being attached to a therapist or feeling sad, et cetera, if you need to move on or if you need to move or something and you can't see them anymore. Is it normal not to have any attachment to your therapist? No, completely normal. Oh, is it normal? So the answer is yes. Sorry. <laughs> Answered that incorrectly. I wouldn't really say I have much of an attachment to anyone in my life. Oh, that's interesting. But I'm moving soon and been with a therapist for almost a year. And I don't care at all that I will either have to stop therapy altogether or find a new therapist aside from the anxiety that comes with moving and meeting new people, etc. So is this normal or a sign of some other issue? Now, it is normal to not really feel crazily attached to your therapist. I've kind of been that way. Uh, although I was really bummed about my therapist in college, Rebecca, being kind of forced to retire. 
And I think part of that came from the fact that we didn't get to like titrate down. We were like in the thick of it. And my dad was really sick and about to pass away. And they like forced her out. And I lost her at a really devastating time. And I think that might have had more to do with it um, than the actual like attachment to her. It was more like I just needed support. And so then I was scrambling trying to find a new therapist. And she gave me some good referrals and we got through and she did phone sessions like for free after the fact. Um, So there's that. But it's, I think it it is normal to feel like it's okay to leave if you feel like you're in a place where you're not, you're not like depend, not dependent on them. Because I don't even want to use that word. It's more like the relationship is usually important to people. And I would even say personally that I felt like the relationship with all of my therapists is important. But with my last therapist, Jana, I'd seen her for years and I'd already been in a place where I was like, I'm kind of ready to move on to someone who's a little more tough love than her. And I had tried out some in this last, like right before COVID and at the beginning of COVID, I tried out a couple people and I just didn't find a good fit. But then we just, then we were moving. So I just kind of put a pause on it. But I, I say all that because I was not sad to really leave Jana. Like we had kind of done the work that we could do together and it was okay to leave. And so I just want you to know that that's kind of normal. You don't have to always feel like, no, don't go. If we're at a place where we're kind of ready to transition or we feel like we've, we're not in a crisis at the moment, if we are able to take our time and know that we're moving and things are changing, then that's okay. However, in this question, when you said, that you don't have much of an attachment to anyone in your life, that is concerning. Now, we always talk, we tend to talk, not always, but most of the time we tend to talk about attachment when it comes to people who are more of a, I don't know if it'd be disorganized, because there's four attachment styles. And let me, I just don't want to, because people call them different things. I want to make sure. So we talk more about the kind of like disorganized attachment or anxious attachment where we can kind of do what I would call like a push pull where we feel really, really attached to someone. And then if we think they're going to leave us, we want to leave them first, or we, we can lash out. Like there can be a lot of that. And that overly attached feeling is what we tend to focus on just from the questions that I receive and the things that we talk about. And so that is just one Well, it's really, we kind of talk about two, but it's only one component of attachment. The other component is that avoidant, right? There is anxious avoidant style of attachment. Um, So, you know, there's like secure, there's avoidant, there's anxious, and there's disorganized. And so the avoidant component or even the disorganized can swing between wanting to be overly attached and like not attached at all. And so that not being attached is the same issue. It's just the flip side of the same problem, meaning that I wouldn't be surprised if your relationship with your family or your whoever your caregivers were growing up, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, whoever, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a lack of emotional support there or maybe even complete neglect or potential abuse in another way, like physical, sexual, whatever. I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't some of that because this kind of like lack of attachment usually is born out of the fact that we can feel like we can't trust anyone to take care of us. And therefore we can be like fiercely independent and think we have to do everything on our own. We can even try to tell ourselves, I don't really like being around people. I don't really like a lot of people and I don't really trust a lot of people. And we can wear that like a badge. Like it makes us feel better about ourselves. Like we're super secure. Don't you worry about me, but it's really a fake facade we put on because we feel too vulnerable or or scared to let someone in. Therefore, we keep everyone away. Hence the, I don't have any attachment to anybody in my life, really. And that is what I would call a sign of another issue. And that's what really is concerning to me. But again, like not having any attachment to your therapist, I don't, is not necessarily, like that doesn't always equate to other issues, but not having anyone in your life that you're attached to is, is a little concerning. So I would bring that up when you find your next therapist and figure out where it's coming from for you. Cool. Let's move on to question number eight. It says, hi, Katie. A few weeks ago, you talked about touch aversion. I did. And I've been wondering about the other side of it. What if you've always had a need for touch and physical affection that's never been met? Very common. I missed out on a lot of opportunities for it in my upbringing, although I did have caring parents because it just wasn't something our family was big on. Some families are like that. Now I'm a single adult working full-time and living alone, and I struggle with anxiety, depression, and self-harm. 
And while I've been on a few casual dates this year, the contact was purely sexual and not affectionate whatsoever. I once heard that if babies aren't touched enough, they cry. So what happens to an adult that isn't? Now, touch aversion is something, it can happen for a lot of reasons, and I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but if we didn't grow up with a lot of touch, or if uh, if we have some kind of sensory processing disorder, if we're autistic, touch can sometimes be a little too much for us. Not for everybody, but I'm just throwing it out there and I'm not going to get into it more than that, but that can cause touch aversion. Also, if it's just not a norm in our family, like the person who asked this question is saying that their parents were caring, but they were not physical at all. Now, my mom's side of the family was actually Le- they're less physical. My dad's is like hug, kiss you on the face, kiss you on the lips if you don't turn your head fast enough. They're very affectionate. So is Sean's family. Also, they're, you know, they're Quebecois, so they kiss you on both cheeks, both cheeks. You got to be prepared for that. Um, anyways, so people have different families growing, you know, you have different things, but I would argue that we all, because yes, this is true that if babies aren't touched enough, they cry. We all need touch. And it's that same thing like connection and attention, humans need that. We're wired for it. Our nervous system is wired to be soothed through touch, eye contact, like sucking and swallowing. Like when babies are fed and the mom or dad is holding them and maybe like rubbing on their face or on their head at all and they're feeding them a bottle, we are touching them. We're trying to make eye contact with them and they're sucking and swallowing. That's why babies can be really fussy and then be soothed through that. Not always, sometimes babies fuss anyways, they need something else done. But I'm just saying that we are soothed through that and it is something that we need. And so because you never grew up with it, it's gonna feel very uncomfortable for you. And getting to a place where you can offer some physical touch that's affectionate and loving it's going to it's gonna take some like opposite action. We're going to have to do it anyways. And we're going to have to push through and try to offer some affectionate touch even if we don't want to. I know that sounds weird, but like if we care enough to, um, to have some, you said you had some casual dates and you were purely sexual. Okay, that's fine. And no, there's nothing wrong with that either. I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying that. But it might have helped maybe on the next date that you go out with someone that you touch their hand. Or when you're walking in a crowd, well, I guess there's not many crowds now, but let's say you're like walking into their place or to their car, you like touch on their shoulder. Or when you talk and you laugh, you touch their arm. Those are all little signs of affection that maybe we can like purposefully add in because by you doing it, then they will do it back. And it's when we don't, and when we kind of maybe might even without realizing it, have some body language that shows that we either don't like it or aren't open to it, or we might've even flinched, um, they might not touch us as much, even if we're really wanting it. And I guess the question here isn't, I'm not actually answering it properly and I apologize. It says, so what happens to an adult that isn't touched enough? It can be hard for us to feel soothed probably, and not to just directly correlate it to this, but probably why you feel anxious, depressed, and self-injure, because we don't know how to soothe. We just feel completely maybe overwhelmed all the time. The self-injury would be probably your biggest coping skill for this. I, I would argue that as you try to incorporate more loving touch into your life, that the self-injury urges might go up at first and then go down. That would be my hypothesis. And it goes up at the beginning because it's uncomfortable and we don't, we don't quite feel soothed right away. So we'll want to use it more, but then if we continue our nervous system will like write itself and we will feel soothed by it. So I think that's why you're struggling with what you're struggling with is because we didn't get enough of that physical affection and enough of that that soothing because it's that overwhelm that we feel within our system, which can look like anxiety. It can look like depression. It can look uh, a lot like hyperactivity for some people or even OCD. We can have a lot of symptoms of mental illnesses as a result of not getting enough touch. And there's tons of studies, I'm not gonna go into them, but there are a ton of studies about how important, uh, and a lot of times they focus on mothers because these studies were done in like the 50s and 60s, but how important touch from a mother or a primary caregiver of any kind is to a baby and is to a growing child, how they can still run back to their mother as a safe haven. And if we didn't really feel like we got enough of that, like touch and compassion and soothing, it's almost like emotional neglect that you sustained without realizing it maybe. Um, Because parents can be completely caring and loving, but not there for us emotionally or physically in the way that we needed. And that means that we just didn't get our needs met. 
And so that's why we can struggle with other mental illnesses and symptoms as a result. Does that make sense? I hope so. And it is something we can heal from. It is something we can work on. It could even be something that you work on with your therapist. I had a patient back in the day, this was at the Eating Disorder Treatment Center, but she was very touch averse because her parents both worked like these high profile jobs and they were never home for her. And she had nannies, but it wasn't the same. And she would be left by herself playing a lot. And she just didn't have a lot of physical touch or even emotional support at all. And so a lot of the work that we did was in me, you know, with her consent, touching her arm and telling her that I'm here for her or rubbing her back, things that she never received. We worked on like the reparenting, remothering and working on her inner child and her doing certain things for herself. For a while, she'd just rub her own arms. Anyway, there's things that you can do and healing can happen. So stick with it. Okay, let's move on to question number nine. This question says, hi, Katie, will a therapist always bring up transference or will they sometimes just notice it and use it as a tool to help heal? What are the signs a client is express is experiencing transference? I have been for a while now and we got into my attachment issues a few weeks ago and she did say something like, you look at me like a mom figure. I was surprised she didn't mention transference. I have heard it can be a touchy subject to discuss. What are your thoughts? This is a great question. Now, sometimes I think a therapist will bring it up when it helps to use it in the session. And that's kind of what your therapist was doing when she said, you look at me like a mom figure. That's them acknowledging that you're transferring another relationship onto them or one that you wish you had. And we can use that therapeutically to say, what is it about our relationship that is so soothing to you? And we can write those things down and we can try to figure out where we can give them to ourselves in other ways and how, how we can maybe come up with some good mother messages that you are able to say to yourself. Again, as a therapist, we do not want to put ourselves into that role. So I would not be saying those messages. I would not be doing those things, but we can use this transference as a way to better understand what's going on and what you're searching for and what you need. And that's, you know, why we would bring it up like that. I don't know if we would necessarily call it transference right away. Not everybody knows that word. And I don't usually say that in session. I would say something more like what your therapist said, like you look at me like a mom figure, or I would say, you seem pretty angry. Do you think that's all directed at me? And I would let it hang until they can express what's going on. They were not always able to identify that it's not all about me. And they might say, yes, it's you, you da, 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 da. And, you know, we can talk about that. But either way, you bring it up just like your therapist did as a way to work, to use it. Now, the reason you might not bring up transference, so the, the, to answer the question roughly, no, a therapist will not always bring up transference, but most of the time we will, we just wait until it's useful because transference can happen from the very get go. But if we don't really know our patient that well, we might not know it to be transference right away. It can take a minute. And we also might not know how it could be useful, right? Okay. They're treating me like this. This seems to be another relationship. I'm not sure what, then I might be able to identify, oh, it's a relationship that they had with their grandma they're treating me that way. Interesting. But there, it's not useful yet because we're not maybe working on that. Maybe we're just working on uh, some tools to get them through their day at work right now because that's like the crisis. You know, it all depends. Um, and so it can be a touchy subject, but I think it's all about how you address it and how you bring it up. And so I just bring it up when it's a useful tool, when that information gives us essentially more information about what's going on and we can use that to help us feel better. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay. A comment on this said, I'd love to hear an answer from Katie for this question. I'm kind of in the same position um, because I'm almost sure I'm experiencing transference with my psychiatrist and I'm also almost sure he already noticed it. Could he be using it as a tool without letting me know? Great question. It's possible. Sometimes we will use that transference that is happening in session to move things forward. Meaning I might know that they're, they're looking at me like a mother figure. And because of that, I can offer up some of those good mother messages and ask them to do the homework of saying it to themselves or even journaling about what the relationship with me feels like to them and how it's useful. And in a way by doing that, or even just, uh, I guess, I guess it's like, I, attaching homework to the transference without saying that that's what you're doing. I'm allowing them to kind of explore that. And if, if there is some healthy transference going on, cause there's healthy and there's also unhealthy when it becomes too much, but if there's healthy transference going on that, that can be used to our benefit until again, until we can either call it out for what it is or work through it so that I don't know if I'm doing a good job explaining this, but it's like, we, we can know it's happening in the room. 
and not say anything about it until it's it's useful and there's a purpose for it. But we can, in the meantime, even if we haven't like acknowledged it or used it, we, we can, in a way, without our patient maybe even knowing, use it to identify other issues, to help come up with different homework and things that we should work on. And honestly, even as a therapist on the backside, if I acknowledge or if I notice the transference is happening, I may not say anything right away, but I'll take notes about it and it will kind of help guide the therapy on its own. So it's like, I'm going to acknowledge it and it'll be maybe a driving force in some of the work that we do together and part of your treatment plan but I might just not call it out or draw attention to it yet. Again, because it might not be helpful yet. Does that make sense? Because it's almost like going back to that question where the person was asking, why didn't my therapist tell me that who I was dating was a narcissist? Like they could have saved me. Sometimes we don't say that it's transference or let you know that that's what it is yet because it's, you're not there yet. You won't be able to acknowledge or accept that and it could even, we could even run into defense mechanisms as a result. Like if early on your therapist said, I feel like you're treating me like your mom. I mean, I would never say it like that, but let's just say they said it that way. If they said that to you, you might get defensive and say, no, I'm not. I know you're not my mom. What are you trying to say? I'm a grown adult. We could get very defensive about it. And so it's all about the timing and how useful the information is in the moment. And that kind of helps us decide whether we're using it or not and how really, and whether we're going to acknowledge it with you. Does that make sense? Okay. Final question, question number 10. And man, I got some pod nose going on today. It is very itchy. Okay. This question says, hi, Katie. I noticed you don't really have any videos telling parents how to help their children with mental health issues. I'm surprised that I don't. I think I have one, maybe two. I think I do have some, by the way. Um, How should parents go about supporting their children when their children won't talk to them about what's going on? Also, can you start making more videos for parents? Thank you. Also, how did... Um, How do you be a good parent when you yourself have mental health issues? I have PTSD, bipolar one, and borderline personality disorder, and I'm working really hard on myself, but I know it still causes issues, and I don't want to mess my kids up because of my issues. Any advice would be very appreciated. Love your videos so much. Thank you for being you. Oh, of course. I'm so glad. Um, I'm happy to make more videos for parents. But this was a really good question. The best way to be a good parent, and somebody left a comment like this, and they're like, I'm hoping there's more, and there is more. But the best way... When your parent, when your kids don't talk to you about what's going on, which probably means that they're in their teens, we just have to check in on them and be there, offer support. Now they cannot want it and they can even get kind of flustered because they're teenagers. They're always flustered, but it's okay to go to your kids and say, Hey, just wanted to check in, you know, make sure everything's okay. I know things have been really stressful. I mean, obviously this last two years have been just like a total shit show. So it's fair to say like, I know things have been horrible and online school and now back in school or whatever your situation is. Um, if you ever want to see a therapist or anybody talk to talk to someone about what's going on, let me know. I'm happy to, and they can be like, mom, get out of here. I don't want to, I'm not interested. You're always so pushy. Remember? And you say, okay, okay, okay. i just want to let you know. And then, you know, a couple weeks go by or something and we check in on them. Hey, how was, how was school or how, how'd that thing go or blah, blah, blah. How are you doing? Just want to check in. And again, if you ever want to talk to someone, they'll be like, I know, you know, I don't know, but we can just keep checking in, keep letting them know that there are resources available. And unfortunately, that's kind of it. Because again, like I have to say over and over again, we cannot make anybody, even our children. I know you think you can make them do shit, but I'm pretty sure if you have a child, you know, you can't make them do things. We cannot make a child get better. We cannot make them. All we can make them do really is go to therapy. But I can tell you from experience, please don't force your child into therapy like that. Let them guide it at least a little bit. Let them at least pick the therapist or something. Because if children are forced against their will when they really don't want to go in, I used to see children of, through divorce stuff. I used to work at this clinic, the uh, Center for Individual and Family Counseling in North Hollywood. And we had a lot of those like court mandated people. Oh my God, the worst. Because they don't want to be there. They don't want to see anybody. And half the time they don't even talk. I can't tell you how many of my friends in middle school told me that they were forced into therapy because their parents were getting divorced and they would just sit there in silence. (laughs) And I was like, wow, that's so uncomfortable. Um, But that's why we want them to feel like they do have some say. Forcing them in is not a good idea. Now, how do you, the second part of this question, uh, how do you 
be a good parent when you yourself have mental health issues, the best thing we can do when it comes to that is to be honest. Now, this does not mean that our, our children are our therapists or our friends. We do not talk to them in that way. We do not share all the ways that our mental illness is affecting us, but we do talk about how it's affecting them. It sounds like you're re recognizing maybe some behaviors you've had or are having, or maybe some issues that have come up. It could even be like impulsivity and things that you do. Maybe it's spending or things you do at home, right? If we're talking board, uh, bipolar one and BPD, we, we could have some of those types of things. It is completely okay and acceptable to talk to children. Depending on their age, you might want to change the language, but I believe all children are open to understanding emotions and we should start talking with children about them more quickly in life so that they can have some emotional intelligence. We can tell them how that feels for us and we can tell them what we're working on. So let's say you had a manic episode and your children experienced it and that could have been really scary, depending on what your bipolar one, your mania, what it presents as. I'm just throwing out an example. It's completely okay to say to your children after the fact, I am so sorry that, you know, you saw me the way you saw me last week. I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't taking care of myself. And, you know, you, you know, I have what's called bipolar one disorder and that causes some of those episodes. And I just want you to know that I'm happy to talk with you about it because I didn't mean to scare you and you know I love you. It's just a, a mental health issue that I'm dealing with and, and you know about you know mommy's mental illness or however you wanna verbalize it. But that's something that you can say. And then we just have to be open to letting them ask questions. And as much as we can fight, do not get defensive. Just try to share, say, it just feels like this to me. Cause they might say, what is that like for you mom? Or why does that happen? Or why did you do this or that or the other thing? And you might say, I don't know, but I'm trying to learn. And I understand from my psychiatrist, da, 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 da. or you might even say to your therapist or psychiatrist, hey, could I bring one of my kids and maybe, you know, maybe all of them or one of them doesn't matter. It's up to you, up to them really also. I want to bring them in so you can help explain a little bit more about my borderline or my PTSD or my bipolar one and, and let them learn you know, but you can give them the names for it and you can offer books or resources or videos or things that are helpful so that they can understand. But please talk to them about it and let them know it's okay to talk about it and let them ask questions and answer them as best you can. I think that's really the best way so that they know that your mental illness is not their fault and they didn't do anything to cause it. They can understand better the symptoms you're experiencing, the behaviors that they see that are affecting them. So they have like a word to put to it. Oh, mommy's just doing this da, 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 because of her PTSD. I'm just, I know last time, then the other thing I want to throw in out here before I end is like letting them know what you could use from them in the moment. Like you could say, Hey, if you notice mommy's getting this way, you can call this number and that's your psychiatrist, your therapist or whatever. Or, you know, I just need a, you to give me some space. That means I'm just, I'm being triggered and I'm having a PTSD response or whatever it is, letting them know how they, what they can do. So then they feel empowered to, to, to help you. And especially when it comes to, you know, bipolar one or even, even PTSD and borderline, like that means that sometimes we aren't in our right mind. We can do things that could be harmful or dangerous or, you know, mania in and of itself, if it goes untreated, we can do things like spending money or being impulsive that could be dangerous. And the sooner we get help, the better. So if they want to call our psychiatrist or therapist and let them know this is happening, that could be really, really helpful too. But that's just a couple, that's just some of my advice for that. Because I think so often we think, oh, our kids don't notice. And if we just don't tell them about it and don't talk to them about it, it'll be fine. And we'll just be able to move on. Kids, they know more than we, they let on. They're super, super, they're great observers of environments and they always are picking up information and the they have great insight. I think we we don't give them enough credit. And so do yourself a favor, talk to them about it because they already know what's happening, but we need to give them real language and real to do's and ways to help so that they feel empowered and not at fault and they can better understand, you know, mental illness because it's, it's everywhere in our world. And the, the more children we can raise who understand mental illness and are able to talk about it and not 
I love that kids these days aren't as stigmatized as like kids were when I was growing up. So I think that's always great too. But the more we can do this, the better. And that means that then they'll be having real conversations. And if they do want to get into therapy, which then, especially after an episode, or if you had a symptom and you want to talk to them about it, you can say, and that's why I've been offering therapy because you know, you need to have a place to talk about this too, because I go and talk about it with my own therapist, but you know, I want you to have a place that's safe as well. And you know, see if they take you up on it. But I know kids can be like, get out of here, mom. And that's fine too. But we just have to continually be there and support and talk about it as much as we can. Thank you all so much for sending in your questions. Thank you for listening. Please share this podcast with your friends and family. You just never know who it's gonna help and who might be looking for some resources. Um, I ask for the questions if you're wondering on Sunday mornings over on my podcast channel in the community tab, I will post and you can leave a comment below that post asking for your questions. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time. Bye. You can ask her why breakups suck or why you've hit a plateau. Inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know.